Another key part of this information management around healthcare, and healthcare nowadays is much more than laboratory tests and x-rays and petri dishes and blood tests and that sort of thing. It is much more about information management. Information management between doctors, between all members of the healthcare team, nurses, AMAs, hospital assistants, scheduling folks, technicians, uh, other physicians and other systems, and between the patient, family, and the healthcare team. Dr. John Scott, our second speaker, is medical director for telemedicine at the University of Washington, associate professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and is responsible for launching Project ECHO, which connects clinicians in rural and underserved areas. His research areas are in viral hepatitis and the use of telehealth technologies to improve the care of patients with infectious disease issues. He earned his degrees from Stanford, seems to be a Stanford theme today, and Georgetown University School of Medicine. Dr. Scott will be talking about getting patients and doctors on the same page, telemedicine. John? Thank Great, thanks Mika. Um, so I wanted to start tonight um, with a story. And uh, the premise of the story is I often get asked, well, how'd you get into telemedicine? And so my epiphany moment um, was in January of 2008. And to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, at that time, I was a young investigator. I had a lab and I was, uh, had an NIH grant and was studying hepatitis C. And part of my um, obligations as a junior faculty was to give talks around the, the Northwest and whammy. And so I was uh, asked to give a talk in this, this town here. This is Haver, Montana. Uh, has anyone been to Haver, Montana? A couple people, okay. Yeah, so Haver is about uh, 50 miles from the Canadian border on the High Line, and um, it's not the most tropical place in January. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I flew out to Billings, and then I took this airline called Big Sky, which I learned later used to be called Big Scare. Um, and it was kind of like riding the local bus. You would get up, you had like two or three other passengers, and you'd fly for about 15 minutes, land, drop one guy off, and get another guy. And we finally made it to, to Haver, and it was, it was like a Monday night, uh, and I thought no one was gonna come to hear this junior investigator at UW to talk about hepatitis C. And I was surprised. I had 80 people filled the, the room uh, where I was speaking, and they told me we have a horrible hepatitis C problem. Um, and it was partly driven by uh, the methamphetamine epidemic at that time. And they were really discouraged. They said, we, we've actually stopped testing people because we can't get our patients treated. We live too far away from uh, places that um, can be, uh, will see our patients and treat them. And so that got me thinking, there's got to be a better way. And that kind of set me on my journey uh, in telemedicine and, and how I was able to launch a program called Project Echo. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But I, I hope you understand how patients are often um, the greatest motivators for our research and kind of real uh, sometimes a 90 degree uh, turn in our, in our, our research and in our career. So I'm gonna start off with what is telehealth? So this is what the federal government defines as, as telehealth. It's the use of electronic information and telecommunications technologies to support long distance, clinic, uh, clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. Kind of a long definition there. Um, and for, for tonight, I'm gonna use the, def the words telehealth and telemedicine interchangeably, but if you were gonna be a purist, telemedicine really applies to the clinical aspect of care. So what I wanna do though is actually give you some pictures of how we're um, delivering telehealth at the University of Washington. So the first way we are delivering it is through a live face-to-face -face, um, televideo visit. Um, so you can see in this picture here, there's a doctor who's uh, talking to a patient remotely and we've been doing this for years in telepsychiatry, um, and I'll talk about some other programs we've been doing. I, I do want to mention, Joanne, that you can actually join your mom at her next visit. So there's the ability to have three or four way conversations. It's not, st not just a two way there. There's also um, store and forward. So you're storing some kind of a digital image 
along with a little description, and then forwarding it to the clinical expert. And they um, reveal that information, and then within a day or so, they write back and say, this is what I think it is. This is what you can, I don't know if you can see this picture here, is a um, dermatologist who's reviewing a skin lesion. And so we've been doing, using this for both teledermatology and teleburns. So the third way that you can deliver telehealth is through remote monitoring. So this is where you have some kind of a device um, that takes measurements from the patient. And in this example, you can see a woman who's taking her um, blood pressure cuff. And then that data gets wirelessly um, transmitted to their, their doctors. And so they can be proactive in, in managing that condition. And then what I um, helped to launch was more this case-based teleconferencing where um, there's actually no patient, but they talk about um, the actual patients and cases, and it can be a very multidisciplinary um, panel. I'm gonna come back and go into those in a little bit more detail. So let's first talk about that face-to-face -face consultation. So what we've been doing in the last several years is a teleburns clinic, and you can see a picture here of Dr. Pham in uh, plastic surgery at Harborview. And he's actually in an exam room on either side of him are actual um, patients um, in the next exam rooms. And we just uh, kind of retrofitted a little closet there to be a telehealth exam room. Um, and he has his electronic medical record open, a little webcam, and then he's actually uh, checking on a, a patient's uh, burn on their hand. Um, and next to him is actually an occupational therapist who, once Dr. Pham's done, he's going to go through some of the, the uh, exercises they need to do. We also have teledermatology from here at the University of Washington to our uh, affiliated hospital at Northwest. So if there's any kind of um, uh, rash in, in a patient who's hospitalized, we can um, have them evaluated. We also have a maternal fetal medicine program with um, Yakima, the Yakima Memorial Hospital. So these are mostly women who have gestational diabetes. And, and this is a picture here on the bottom of Dr. Justine Chang, who's she's talking to her nurse. That's not an actual patient. Um, and so that's been a really successful program that has really obviated any trips for the patients uh, here to Seattle. They don't have to drive over the pass every month to, to have their diabetes medications fine-tuned. I mentioned telepsychiatry. We also have a travel medicine program. If you're a University of Washington employee, you can access that. And that's, um, I, I've personally used it, and, and it was a, a really nice to have that. So the other thing we've been doing for about the last year is something called the virtual clinic. And this is... Um, a kind of an urgent care clinic um, that's uh, done online. So I want to walk you through it. This is what the website looks like. What we're trying to address are um, lower acuity urgent care needs. So the most common conditions we're treating are urinary tract infections, rashes, um, pink eye, um, a cough. Um, some of those things that you know are irritating as a patient. You, you know, you're not sure if I should go to the emergency room. You know, it's going to be a couple days or maybe a week to see my primary care doctor. But for this um, service, you, there's a, a phone number you can call or you can go straight to the website um, and they walk you through how you're going to get set up to, to have a, um, a televideo visit with a doctor. It's $40. Um, uh, just take credit cards now. If you're part of our ACN, it's free. So if you're part of our accountable care network, it's free. Um, and it's usually within seven minutes. Um, so we've been doing this uh, for about 13 months now, um, have over a 95% patient satisfaction with this, and I've seen over 1,000 patients um, through the virtual clinic. And as an infectious disease physician, I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, how often we're prescribing antibiotics. It's actually 20% lower for um, lower respiratory tract infections compared to in-person uh, visits for the same condition. So that's one of the quality improvement metrics we're tracking. Uh, and interestingly, fit over 50% of our patients don't have a primary care doctor. So it's a great way to introduce them into the patient-centered medical home and primary care. The most common user is actually a young woman. Um, so um, that they're um, a little bit more tech savvy and, and make a lot of decisions for their, uh, their family and their healthcare decisions. So next I'm going to talk about remote monitoring. And this is an example from a program called the Tele-ICU. And I, I made a visit to the University of Mississippi and took this picture of one of the nurses there who's um, monitoring a whole ICU about 50 miles away from Jackson. 
And what he's seen is um, their vital signs, so continuous vital signs. He has their, their EKG rhythm strips. Um, he has their medical records. He can go in there. And he also has a camera in their room. So if he needs to talk to them or talk to the nurse, he can zoom in to the point where he can actually see the individual settings on all the various uh, machines. So you might be wondering, well, gosh, is this safe? And this actually has been studied. Um, and this was uh, a study that I want to tell you about. Um, this study looked at patients who had the tele-ICU service available and, so, and then compared it to other hospitals that did not. And what they found is that the mortality was 26% better in programs that had an, a tele-ICU program. And the length of stay, that's what LOS stands for, was on average 0 0.5 to 3.6 days shorter, depending on what your reason for ICU stay was. And part of the reason why this is important is, as you know, many were actually having more patients come to the ICU. That's a, uh, partly a result of the silver tsunami, the aging of the baby boomers. But also, um, most I ICUs in the United States don't have trained specialists. And we call them intensivists, so they're usually pulmonary critical care doctors or anesthesiologists. And especially, they don't have them at night, when a lot of things kind of go sideways. So this is um, a program that um, can be very useful. And are there any nurses in the audience? Nurses, a couple of nurses. So I, I, this last point I want to make is, is you might really appreciate is that there was, on average, 90 minutes less charting time for nurses per shift when you have a tele ICU program. So um, the nurses really like this. So the other uh, remote monitoring program that has been published in the literature was a study from the UK. And they took three types of patients, uh, patients who had diabetes, uh, COPD or emphysema, and then heart failure. And um, they gave them a device that they could go home with. Um, and they tracked either their, their weight, their blood pressure, their glucose readings. Um, and half of the people were, were randomized to have this. The other half got usual care. And after one year, the mortality rate was one half in the group that had the remote monitoring. And this is of thousands of patients. So um, you're 46% uh, less likely to die if you had this, and also had a lot fewer admissions, so 20% less likely to be admitted. So we actually uh, tried this uh, at uh, Harborview Medical Center. We took 30 patients um, who were in our heart failure clinic, and they were patients who we knew were um, admitted to the hospital pretty frequently, three or four times a year. And we gave them one of these devices. You can see it's pretty easy to understand. It kind of looks like a jitterbug. Um, you know, nice easy buttons to push and, and big font. Um, it's about the size of an iPad. And then it has um, the following devices attached to it. It has a, a scale that kind of plugs into the side and stand on it, a blood pressure monitor, uh, a pulse oximetry to measure how much oxygen is in their blood, and then a one lead EKG strip. And what happened is they would um, do these readings every morning, and then it would be transmitted wirelessly to the heart failure clinic at Harborview. And this is kind of the dashboard we got. And it really, very quickly, you can see who was out of range on those readings. If they were in red, then, the, then we needed to do something about that. If they're yellow, you know, we might give them a call, might watch it the next day, and in green, they were fine. Um, so we like this because it was being proactive rather than reactive, because reactive. we know when heart failure patients get sick, they often don't just come to the floor, they go straight to the ICU, and, and that can be a very expensive and long stay for them. So we were able to make really fine adjustments. And so during this 90-day pilot of these 30 patients, we had absolutely no admissions. Um, we did have one patient who came to the emergency department, and it was because they choked on a hot dog. So, uh, and for the cardiologists in the audience, it was a low salt hot dog we heard. <laughs> um, so this was a, a, a really well-received uh, pilot project that we did. But I think one of the really exciting areas is how we, we can use our smartphones and mobile apps. And I wanted to highlight two um, really um, innovative um, projects that have been developed here by faculty members. The first is called BillyCam. And that was developed by a pediatrician named Jim Stout and a um, computer science uh, professor, Shwetek Patel. And they're trying to solve this problem of diagnosis of neonatal jaundice. So some babies, when they're born, they're yellow. And um, if they're really yellow, that can be bad for their brain. Um, and if you're in a resource-limited uh, setting, maybe say like Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't have a blood test, 
then it's, it can be very difficult to know how jaundiced they are and whether they need therapy or not. So they did a very ingenious and simple um, a application where they have a little color metric um, uh, a piece of paper here, and then they just take a picture of that paper on the baby's skin, and this is accurate to one gram per deciliter, and they can see whether the baby needs to be put on phototherapy or not. So um, they um, got a Life Science Discovery Fund grant for that and, and are developing that. The other um, app that has been developed locally is by um, Dr. Heather Evans, who's a trauma surgeon at Harborview, and Dr. Bill Lober, who's an emergency medicine doctor. And they're trying to solve this problem of post-surgical wound infections. So um, I, I think that a lot of patients don't want to bug their docs. Um, and, and, so, and sometimes they might wait too long before um, they call us. And if they do call us, sometimes they get someone who's never ever seen them. You know, they call them at night and they don't know who it is and, and you just need to see it, right? So the default in the past for post-surgical problems is, well, why don't you just come to the emergency department, we'll see you there. Well, if anyone's been in the emergency department, it'll take hours sometimes. So what they did is, well, why don't you just take a picture every day of the wound and tell us if you're having any symptoms, whether you're having um, redness, whether you're having fever, whether you're, any kind of discharge and you just send it to it. This is all secure, um, and they can, again, intervene proactively, put them on antibiotics if they need to, or have them come in to, if it needs to be debrided. Um, so this is in development. And then there are also some other um, applications that are available um, on, the, on the marketplace. Um, we beta tested one called CellScope Odo, and this is a little device here that you can put on the back of an iPhone 5 or higher device and it shoots video of your ear. You can take still and video of your ear. So if any of you remember having kids um, and who had a lot of ear infections, you know, just think about it at two in the morning when your kid's screaming and you don't want to go to the emergency department, you just you know, you call your doc and say, I took a video and I'm gonna send it to you and you can look at it. Um, I'm married to a pediatrician, so I, get that, I hear those calls in the middle of the night all the time. The other um, app and device is um, something called a live core, and it actually is a one lead EKG uh, device that you just hold up to, uh, to your chest and you can detect any kind of rhythm disturbances. So there's just, just a small sampling of diagnosis through, of acute problems, but I think the real exciting areas are in the diagnosis and management of chronic problems. So we talked earlier about COPD. This device here measures um, the spirometry, so how well are you inflating your lungs? And, uh, and this, again, can be transferred to your doctor and they can make some changes in your medications. Diabetes, so a lot of people are recording their um, glucose readings, whether it's in a log or actually on the device, but it doesn't always get to the doctor in a timely fashion to intervene. So um, this is a, an area of active development and, of course, hypertension. So what are some of the issues with remote monitor? Sounds like a great idea, right? Well, when I talk to my colleagues about this, they're saying, we don't want this. <laughs> um, because we're gonna be crushed with all this data. If you think of an average primary care doctor who has 1,500 or 2,000 patients, maybe 20% of those are diabetics, and every single one of them are gonna be downloading you know, hundreds of data. We just don't know how to sort through the, all this information, and how do we triage all this actionable data? So that's kind of a, um, a medical informatics problem. The other problem is how do we get paid? And I actually think of all those problems, that's probably gonna be the easiest one as we switch to more of a value-based care medicine setup rather than fee-for-service. But this is an area of um, a lot of discussion right now. So uh, next I wanna talk about more of the doctor-to-doctor -doctor consultations. Um, and to kinda of set the stage for this, what we're trying to do is kinda of like the Chinese proverb, um, that goes something like this. If a hungry man comes to you and you want him to eat for a day, you give him a fish. If you want him to eat for a lifetime, you teach him how to fish. So we're trying to teach primary care doctors how to take care of some common, complex, chronic diseases. And for the doctors in the audience, this is kind of like morning report. So when we were in training, we'd stay up all night, admit 15, 20 patients, and the next morning we would present to our colleagues, um, the patients we had worked up, and, and get helpful real-time feedback. Uh, and this is a, a picture of one of our, our sessions. Uh, this comes from our, uh, a session that happens on Thursdays, and we're talking about HIV. Dr. Christian Ramers is leading it. 
And just to give you an idea of who's around the virtual table here, we have folks from Anchorage, Boise. We invaded Oregon. Uh, these guys are in Oregon, right here and here. Uh, these guys are in um, Bozeman. And, uh, and then uh, we have some folks from Eastern Washington. And so we, we uh, do this once a week, typically during the noon hour. And uh, usually start off with a 10 to 15 minute didactic, something that's really useful. We try not to get too theoretical. Uh, and uh, we have the cases sent in advance. There's no patient information on it, no names, no birth dates, anything like that. And um, they present to us, they talk to, to us um, about the case. And the key thing is that Dr. Ramers doesn't just do this by himself. He's got a team of uh, other doctors with expertise in psychiatry, addiction, medicine, uh, pharmacy, um, who are giving them a comprehensive opinion. So they're really getting uh, one-stop shopping with lots of different minds thinking into it. And, and one of the things that's really exciting is that it's not just a one-way uh, street uh, in terms of the information flow. It's not just us at the University of Washington teaching folks in the, in the community. It's actually them teaching each other and teaching us. Because what we've learned is that sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And some of the most creative and innovative solutions actually come from some of our colleagues out in the rural areas. So what we're trying to do is really demonopolize knowledge. I'm going to say that again. We're trying to demonopolize knowledge. I don't think you'd probably ever hear that here at the University of Washington. But we really feel like this is um, responsibility that you as taxpayers and, and Washington residents, or that you want the knowledge that we're creating here to get out and everyone can benefit from that. So what we're, we're creating is little mini centers of excellence uh, and that these, if you ever come to one of these sessions, um, you might say, gosh, these guys feel like they're, they've already got advanced training, they're like fellows. Um, and they said, no, these, they've just been doing it for you know, six or 12 months and just have learned a lot uh, during that time. So I wanted to um, share uh, some comments from one of my colleagues, and this is uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Jones, who's a graduate of the University of Washington School of Medicine, and he works in Newport, Washington, which is in Pend Oreille County. So I'm gonna dim the lights here and just uh, start the interview. And I'm wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about your clinic population, and especially the types of, of problems that your patients are presenting with. Like what's a typical day look like? Um, sure. So, again, so we, um, you know, Newport is in Pend Oreille County, uh, depending upon the, the survey, it's either the poorest or the second poorest county in the state. Um, our population is just your kind of typical rural underserved population. Um, a, you know, a typical problems are kind of the usual problems of four rural areas, diabetes, hypertension, but mostly the complications thereof. I mean, you know, we see a lot of um, again, not well-controlled diabetics, but complex, uh, sick diabetics, markedly elevated A1Cs, a lot of obesity, smoking, tobacco use, substance use. Um, it's kind of very typical problems for underserved areas. Right. Good. And so, um, Jeff, you've been working with me on Project ECHO for hepatitis C for over five years. Has that been correct? I think so. It's a little frightening, but yeah, I think so. Yeah, so what, what kind of motivated you to get involved in the Project ECHO Hepatitis C? Um, it's Hepatitis C, act, access to Hepatitis C treatment here has been hard for a really long time. Um, before Project ECHO, we really had only one physician in the region uh, who accepted Medicaid. Uh, they were over in Colville, and so most of our patients could not, you know, afford to drive an hour and a half over a nasty pass to Colville to get Hepatitis C treatments. Um, there were some uh, occasional private insured people with hepatitis C who could access treatment in Spokane, but it was pretty few and far between. And so, um, again, kind of been like this smoldering frustration of mine that hep C treatment was totally unavailable here. And so when I uh, just, I don't, I like attended a lecture on the life sciences grant and this was mentioned, I thought, hey, we have got to do that. Um, and then it's just kind of grown from there. Grown from there. Right. And what's the experience been like? If you were to explain yeah, this to like one of your colleagues, your friends, how would you describe it? Yeah, yeah, it's a really positive experience. Um, 
it's positive in that one, we can get people treated for hep C, we get them treated here in the community, um, you know, so we're accessing our own lab, our own ultrasound, they're not having to travel. Um, and then just from a, you know, one of the biggest challenges of a rural physician is isolation. Um, you tend to get a stagnation of ideas, you're not ex exposed to physicians outside of your little group of five or six docs. And so by being able to be exposed to physicians working in Seattle um, or just and all over the region with the different ideas and approaches they have, and not just to hep C, but with uh, psychiatric issues, with substance use, with liver disease, um, it's really Im it's improved my care and certainly improved my knowledge base um, around these areas. Can you speak to how being part of Project Echo is maybe improved your communication with your patients and, and just the knowledge that you're able to transmit to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that's the, the main thing. I think one of the key tenets of communication or of effective communication with patients is you've got to know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and your communication skills can be as, as good as you want, but if you don't know what you're talking about, it doesn't matter. And so, you know, the better my knowledge base, the more effectively I'm going to be able to vary my communication style and communicate the, the specifics to each individual patient in a way that they can understand. Well, anything else, Jeff, that you kind of think is important about um, telemedicine in general or Project Echo in particular? Mm -hmm. um, I think this style of telemedicine is really effective. I think the style of telemedicine where you have a patient in front of a robot or a patient in front of a computer screen um, is not effective. You know, I've worked with that style in Western Alaska. We have the um, stroke robot here from Sacred Heart, and I just find that that's not effective. But where you have a primary care physician that's able to get the support from the subspecialist, or you know, again, improving the knowledge base and confidence of the primary care phys physician. But that can be effective. And so I think this has been really effective. So how many patients have you been able to treat um, since being a part of uh, Project ECHO? Uh, we've evaluated 115 patients, and we have uh, 26 cures and about 10-ish or so currently on treatment and 10 that have been treated and are waiting on test of cures. Great. So, Great. And anticipate then really about, you know, 45 folks that, um, we'll have, you know, another six months, we'll have cure to their hep C. That's great. Yeah, congratulations. So I just wanted to um, highlight one of the things that, that um, Dr. Jones said is that one of the first things about effective communication is you got to know what you're talking about. Uh, so that, that's kind of a basic thing, but we don't, we don't always uh, remember that. So um, I, I just wanted to highlight that this is safe and effective. Um, this was a study that was done by my colleagues at the University of New Mexico looked at um, the treatment of hepatitis C in the academic medical center, so the University of New Mexico, and then patients who are treated through the ECHO consultation. They had almost exactly the same cure rate, around 57, 58%. What, what's not shown in the slide is the safety rates. So actually, the patients in the ECHO site, only 7% had an adverse event versus 14% in the fancy schmancy academic medical center. The other thing that was really exciting is that the ECHO um, sites had way more minorities. So nearly two-thirds of the patients in the ECHO were either Latino or uh, Native American versus only 40%. So we really um, like that this is reversing some of the health disparities. So um, we started with hepatitis C in 2008 and have expanded to these other diseases, um, HIV, end-stage liver disease, tuberculosis. We are, we're about to launch one for heart failure just had our first um, session for geriatrics, hoping to launch one for diabetes, and, and there's also um, some other programs that are similar, uh, telestroke and telepain. So the, the next thing I wanted to talk about, um, again, with a doctor-doctor doctor consultation, is something called an e-consult. And one of the things that happens uh, as a physician is you often will get a curbside consult. So that's the person, the time where you're maybe about to put, get in your car or you're in the elevator and someone says, oh, I had this question, or sometimes an email question. Um, and, and you kind of have very limited information. Um, we do this all the time. What we're trying to do is formalize that a little bit and get more information. Um, 
And so let me just walk you through what that's um, going to look like. So th this is just an example uh, from the University of Wisconsin. Um, it happens to be for a hematology consult. So this is um, uh, a primary care doctor who wants to get an opinion from a hematologist about a patient who has a blood clot. Um, and they send this consult in through the electronic medical record, and it's a fairly standard set of questions. So you can see um, this is a 49-year-old patient who's had a blood clot, um, has a strong family history, so lots of family members with this. And so uh, she sends us in, and about a day later, day later, she gets this response from her friendly hematologist. And he says it's unlikely that you need to do further testing uh, just because you have such a strong family history and, and you're not going to change what you're going to do. So um, you can see that this, the um, patient and the doctor got their answer very quickly. Within an hour, the doctor was able to review the chart thoroughly, and it really saved everyone time and money. And so we are, are piloting this um, at the University of Washington for uh, four um, specialty areas. Um, Dr. Jenny Brody is leading the hematology effort, um, and we also have um, uh, dermatology endocrinology, and, and also urology. So we're piloting this um, in conjunction with several other academic medical centers around the United States. So I just wanted to end on some more general notes. Um, and, and when I talk to friends and family, they say, gosh, this seems to make a lot of sense. Why, why isn't it more common? And so I wanted to walk through some of the, the barriers. Um, so first is the reimbursement and funding model. And um, I have some good news to share with you on the next several slides on that. But also credentialing licensing. Um, so if I'm seeing a doctor at another hospital, I'm actually charting in their records and, and I need to be, you know, they need to make sure that I know what I'm doing and I went to the medical school, I said I did. So that is, there's some, you know, paperwork needs to be filled out. Um, physician acceptance, believe it or not, um, some doctors, you know, say this is not as good as, you know, having them come to see me in person. And I would agree, sometimes you do need to see the patient. But a lot of what I do is talking to patients. I explain their, their diagnosis, I explain their prognosis, talk about treatment options. And for that purpose, I think that um, telemedicine is a, is a great uh, way to, um, to accomplish that. Also workflow, there's just a lot more moving parts. You, know, you have to coordinate with the technology on both sides, so we need to work that out. Um, the technology. Um, I think in the past it was very expensive, but it's now getting much, much cheaper on the order of about one one hundredth what it was even about five or six years ago when I started. Um, it cost about 500000 to have the whole setup, and now it's less than $10,000. It's a, a, just a reflection of things going to cloud-based um, computing. And then I think it's really important that a lot of what we do is based on trust, and so relationships are very important and in building that trust. There is no... Um, replacement for just going out there and meeting a lot of people. And so I do, the, uh, I've gone to see Dr. Jones in, in Pondere and, and uh, that, that went a long ways to establishing that relationship. So I, I wanted to come back to the reimbursement issue and uh, in April, Governor Inslee signed Senate Bill 5175. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that's gonna transform telemedicine reimbursement. I just wanted to highlight the people who supported that. So Senator Becker, um, if anyone's in her district, please thank her. And then um, uh, Dr. Uh, Representative Burquist, who's actually a representative from, in this district from um, Laurelhurst, was also the co-sponsor. So what this bill does is it mandates that health plans, uh, that includes insurance companies and Medicaid, have to reimburse for telemedicine if the following criteria are met. So if there's a live face-to-face -face video consultation, and if the plan already uh, covers the um, benefit and it's recognized an essential benefit, they do, under their current um, bill, have to be in seven designated facilities. They, they cannot be at home, which um, we're working on. Um, last week, the Senate voted to amend that to include home, and the House is going to vote this week. So we're crossing our fingers at home. I mean, it makes sense to have home as an originating site. Um, so what are some of the opportunities? I think we're really at a, a point in time where we're moving from fee-for-service to value-based care. And this is where uh, telemedicine really is, I think, gonna, think is gonna find its sweet spot. And it's really gonna decrease those low-value visits. So those are the visits that, as a patient, you fight traffic, it takes you 15 minutes to find parking, 
You spend 10 minutes talking to the doctor, and most of the time, sorry, Joanne, they're not seeing you, but they're like maybe charting away and not looking at the chart. We're trying to um, uh, obviate some of those and make it just a little bit easier through telemedicine. Also, telemedicine allows for better coordination and standardization of practices. So I mentioned that the technology is getting a lot cheaper. Um, there's increasing broadband and cell coverage, which is going to make getting access to the internet much easier. And then increasingly, you're going to be aware of this and know that this is available. And that's probably going to be the, the largest uh, motivator for this is customer demand. More and more um, uh, employers are offering this as a benefit. Uh, you should know that there's a, a whole society that, uh, called the American Telemedicine Association that has developed guidelines. There's a whole science behind this, and we are a member of that. We contribute to those guidelines. Um, it's uh, both general and specialty specific. So I just wanted to end with a, a, a reminder of what we're all about, and that's to improve the health of the public. We're doing that by meeting the triple aim, which is making it um, more convenient, making a better experience as a patient. We're improving the health of populations and reducing the cost of um, healthcare on a per capita basis. So I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. So while people are coming up, let me ask you a question. Joanne introduced um, some of those Seinfeld episodes and uh, with a rash in Elaine. Um, so Elaine sees on the internet that she can consult with a physician in Oklahoma City, $10 per rash. <laughs> Is that a good idea? Well, um, well um, that sounds a little low. Um, so one of the things that um, you, you do want to know, you do want to know a little bit about that doctor, right? Um, so um, before you click on, you know, connect me, the, the, one of the standard things that is in the ATA guidance is that you have a picture of the, the doc, that you see that they're credentialed. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, and, and we think that um, you know, going to a brand that you know and trust is very important. So um, those are the things that we're trying to develop. There's all kinds of cross-state uh, cross licensure issues, too. <laughs> so legal issues, yeah. too. You There's want to talk about a little bit that? Yeah. So, um, uh, so telemedicine will be legal, will be reimbursable uh, in about uh, 10 months, so long as you're here in, in the state of Washington. So a doctor, in order to see you, um, has to be licensed in the state where you are. So say you guys get sick and you go to Hawaii, uh, or you're in Hawaii and you get sick, um, technically we need to be licensed in Hawaii to, to have that visit. Um, so those, what we're trying to work out is a, a, a better um, process of getting licensure across states. There's an interstate compact that's being considered by our legislature this, this session. So there's a lot of um, kind of regulatory issues that we're trying to sort out. Yeah. That's actually related to my question as well. I was a paramedic in North Carolina, and there they're developing telemedicine technology as well, and they just voted in the legality of it in state. Um, are you going to be able, probably in the next few years, to figure out a way to get that to the Whammy region? Because you have a lot of rural places, as you were talking about, in Montana. Yeah, that's, and that's what I mentioned about the, um, the question was, um, you know, we're, we're part of Whammy, uh, and uh, pat patients do come here all the time uh, because there's things that we offer here that no one else offers in the Northwest. Um, so what we're uh, trying to sign on as a state is something called the Interstate Compact, which basically would make it easier to, um, to get the licensors in a, in a faster process. So um, say um, a doc wants to uh, see by telemedicine doc patients in Idaho, that that's going to be faster. They still need to be licensed in that state, but it's just going to be a faster process. They won't have to start from, from zero to do that whole process. Awesome. And I had a second question. Um, it had to do with the legality of some of the treatments that you do. So with Project ECHO, you're consulting with primary care physicians, and they're technically maybe doing things that are considered maybe not out of scope, but out of standard of practice for a primary care physician. Do you run into any barriers with that? Yeah, so the great question is, you know, some of these, uh, in the past, some of the um, medications we give are pretty toxic, and, and, and we would always, um, you know, say that's a no. Um, and I'd say about 10% of the time, you know, we heard about the case, and we would say, you know, this is, this is a very sick patient, um, and you probably need to send them to Seattle, to the big city, to get evaluated. So 
we always kind of t you know, touch base on how, how comfortable are you um, with doing this and say, you know, we could always revert to you know, an in-person visit. And I think that's why I mentioned the whole um, importance of relationships and trust, that that's, that's a really key thing, is that we understand each other's um, strengths and weaknesses and, and that they know they can ask me any time, not just during the session, but they can page me or call me on my cell phone if they have questions. You mentioned um, gunshot wound and heart attack as being bad topics for telemedicine. Can you expand on the things that are inappropriate? Well, I, I, yeah, so I, the things that are inappropriate is, you know, there's still no replacement for laying hands on a patient. I mean, Dr. Sinanon is a general surgeon. I mean, I think if there's a, a patient with right lower quadrant pain, you think it's appendicitis, I want you to lay hands on that patient. Uh, and we do have limitations on the testing. So if you need a blood test or um, you know, radiology test, that, that does get a little bit more complicated, um, at least in the outpatient setting. Um, so you know, I think that's a part of what I'm, I'm trying to do is to put up the guardrails, <laughs> uh, make sure we're doing this safely, uh, but also effectively. What proportion of care in the next five years will be telemedicine care? Yeah, great question. Um, so Donald Berwick, who used to be the head of uh, Center for Medicare and um, Medicaid Services, predicted that in the next five years, 70% of all outpatient visits will be done through virtual. And I think, uh, yeah, so the brave world, we're trying to gear up for that brave world uh, in, the, in the future. Any other questions for Dr. Scott? Thank you very much. Thank you.